After Batman's introductory speech, there is a pause. Deathstroke unsheathes both of his swords and lunges at Batman for an attack. Batman expertly dodges out of the way, and the two of them square off. Batman is just as agile as ever, and Slade acknowledges it. The squad tries to intervene, but at the behest of Batman, they don't. Those are the skills I remember from ages past. It's a shame you resorted to cheap tricks last we met. Couldn't face me like a true warrior, lurking like a coward in the shadows even in death. This is bigger than us, Slade. We are the only ones who have a chance to stop what's going on out there. I grieved when the world thought you died. I grieved for losing that opportunity to end you myself. You humiliated me and left me in that cell. You earned that cell when you decided to work with those assassins. I was an independent contractor. The bounty on you was too big to resist. But now seeing you dead is reward enough. Listen to me. You need to think. There is no other hope for the world against Brainiac except us. To hell with the world. It was never for me anyway. Not like this. Not like the thrill of the hunt. I know you, Slade. You once fought for this nation and were decorated for it. You were a soldier who inspired Team Seven to fight against threats to humanity once. I just need you to do it one more time. For them, for everyone. I don't care. Deathstroke charges in to slash at Batman's neck. For Grant and Joseph. Deathstroke stops shy of Batman's neck. How do you know those names? I told you, Slade, I know you and who you were. They die if we don't stop this. They died when I put on this uniform. I have no family left in this line of work. They wouldn't even remember me after so much time. I thought for the longest time I wouldn't have a family when I lost my parents. I thought I couldn't let anyone close once I put on the mask. But then there was a boy who I met, who lost so much, as I did, and I saved him. But later I realized, he saved me. Slade, I don't need you to like me, but I need you to know why I keep fighting. It's for them, every last one of them. I know where to find your sons. Help this once and consider your past against me forgiven. I don't need your forgiveness. Don't make me stop you again. Deathstroke is still holding the sword to Batman's neck, but he slowly lowers it. Deathstroke reluctantly joins Batman and the rest of Task Force 9 and X to discuss the plan for the Justice League. Stopping the League is our number one priority. They act as Brainiac's lieutenants destabilizing the rest of the world. The longer we wait, countless more casualties will be added to the list of Brainiac's victims. I have been studying Brainiac's form of mind control on a drone I recovered back in Gotham. He hijacks the host's brain and nervous system using nanobots that infest the body. The key to combating this comes from Lex Luthor. About that, Batman. Lex Luthor is kind of not with us anymore. He, uh, didn't have the heart to go on. That wasn't Lex Luthor. LexCorp's medical division a few months ago unveiled a prototype brain implant that would help people with paralysis use their body again. Of course, Lex has more developed technology for his personal use. He combined the implant with a consciousness synchronization module. A few tips on facial reconstruction from Thomas Elliot and Lex himself has a puppet he can control from almost anywhere in the world. And you know this how? It was a very well-educated guess. Luther is smart but he overlooked all the micro-expressions people inherently have that someone like me would notice. Once you left him after your run-in with the Flash, I recovered the body and the brain implant. DNA evidence proves that it was an unlucky scientist from LexCorp he forced into his schemes. Our job now is to draw out the rest of the Justice League, neutralize them, and with more of these implants, override the nanobot's protocol in order to free them. Sounds simple enough in theory, but speaking from someone who actually fought metahumans, nothing is so simple. They will fight back. I'm counting on it. The first order of business would be to eliminate Green Lantern from the fight. He is the lieutenant that oversees Metropolis and the Skull Ship's shields. Next would be Aquaman, who isolated all of Metropolis Island from anyone trying to cross through or above the waterways. Once both of them are dealt with, the ship is left vulnerable. Brainiac will have no choice but to recall the rest of the League to Metropolis, putting them on defense. How would we take out the Green Lantern? 
We only had a chance of stopping the Flash because a small, eccentric toy maker made anti-Flash devices for all of us. You don't happen to have an anti-Green Lantern device? Funny. You should ask that. Wait. You do have it? Batman goes to a secret compartment in the room and takes out an armored case. He opens it up in front of the team. The contents inside the case glow yellow. Batman takes out a yellow lantern battery. This is a battery I forged out of a yellow lantern ring. A few years ago, when Green Lantern revealed himself to the world, the yellow lantern soon followed. That was one of the first threats the Justice League faced. They captured one of them and the rest fled back into the stars. Green Lantern in public once said that his ring chose him for his great willpower. Shortly after the Yellow Lantern threat was stopped here on Earth, I was visited by this Yellow Lantern ring. I assume that it chose me after its previous owner was captured by the League. Why would it choose someone like you? Hiding from everyone, never intervening. What do you exhibit that made it want you as its next wielder? I heard it speak to me. It wants me to exhibit fear to the whole world. It seeks to corrupt me and refuses to leave me. Eventually, I was able to contain it within this battery, but it still gleams with energy. Energy I never wished to weaponize, but here we are. Anyway, we start with Lantern and move on to Aquaman. Subduing him would be more difficult. We will need to keep him out of the water for longer periods of time to dehydrate him. I am working on a microwave emitter that will help with that, but I am going to need time. So, how do we break the news of your existence to our boss? She has us under her thumb because of these bombs in our heads. She has already been on our tails about our recent hiatuses. Here, signal interfering callers. Put these on once you regroup with Waller. I'll break the news to her myself. They finish their meeting. Task Force X leaves the hideout to return to the Hall of Justice. The squad needs to evade Green Lantern's search effort, which is emboldened by the Flash's recent abduction. Back at the Hall of Justice, they talk to Waller. You have been MIA for quite some time. Care to explain? It takes time for us to come up with ways to kill the most powerful people on the planet. So you must have found something out by now? Oh, we have. We met quite a few interesting people. One in particular was especially helpful. Do you expect me to ask? Tell me. Now! He is a man of certain proclivities. He asked to remain anonymous until he was ready to speak with you. Now is not the time to be testing my patience, Slade. He likes to make an entrance. Just then, all of the monitors and speakers within the hall get hacked and show the iconic bat symbol on it. Then a voice can be heard. Task Force X, put on those collars I gave you. Immediately, the squad puts on the collar before Waller can reach for her tablet to activate any skull bomb. You got me. How's death treating you, Bruce? About as well as life is treating you. You know, I knew your nighttime affairs long before your death, Bruce. And yet you didn't utilize your greatest trump card against me because you knew what I did was right. I just know it best not to refuse free help dealing with the scum plaguing Earth when it is served up to me on a silver cape. So is that how you see Task Force X, too? Free help? I assume you haven't told them your real plan with them. Just think how would they feel after they watch something like this. Batman projects the clip of Waller and Rick Flagg speaking in private, saying how Waller wishes to repurpose Brainiac's mind control tech to control a whole autonomous army of super-powered individuals that will follow every order they are given. Also, how Brainiac's form of mind control is superior to Lex Luthor's since it doesn't require an external host to pilot the body. Once the video stops, the squad all draw their weapons on Waller. You know, I am not very fond of them myself, but even I wouldn't have called them a suicide squad. Do you think they scare me? Batman is suddenly no longer a voice on the monitors, but now is standing right behind Waller. It's not them you should be scared of. Waller turns suddenly to see Batman looming over her. She falters. So, what do you propose we do about our little invader situation? Your men all now listen to my orders and do what I say. Task Force 9 and X are no longer under your control and will work as my allies to neutralize the Justice League and then Brainiac. 9. 
You have Task Force 9 with you? Yes, they're safe, if you were wondering about that. So what about me? You cooperate and maybe I don't consider locking you away in a hole for the rest of your life, for all the crimes against humanity you've committed. Waller reluctantly accepts and the new team explains the plan to Waller. They need Toyman to aid Batman with making more of the Luther brain implants as well as the microwave emitter for Aquaman. Everyone gets to work. Task Force X is ordered to clear out a new, more powerful drone farm that is now mixing the DNA of the heroes with Brainiac drones. They clear it and get Green Lantern's attention. They fight. The squad's goal is to utilize the Yellow Ring battery to protect it from Green Lantern while simultaneously recharging their signature weapons with the yellow energy to combat Lantern's constructs. Green Lantern is getting defeated, but it seems like he harnesses one last ditch effort to summon a missile barrage that will wipe out half the city. No one knows what to do, but Deathstroke gets an idea and dips his hand into the battery's opening. His hand glows with fiery yellow light, and he deals a strike right to the back of Green Lantern's head. Green Lantern falls but isn't unconscious yet. Once Lantern stands up, he yells that he can't see and frantically tries to make some constructs, but to no avail. He is swiftly knocked out by Harley with a hit to the head with her baseball bat. Deathstroke's hand is left burned and scarred but functional. The squad asks how he knew what to do, Deathstroke explains that Green Lantern's ring works on concentration. It was a natural conclusion that if Lantern cannot see, then he would not be able to focus on what to create and where to target. One strike to a pressure point to the back of the head can render the vision center of the occipital lobe inert for days. Batman is impressed with Deathstroke's ingenuity and orders them to return immediately. The microwave emitter is almost done, but it will take at least 30 more minutes. Task Force X begins transporting John Stewart's body back, but just then a loud screeching sound is heard from Brainiac's skull ship. The squad braces themselves for what can come out of the ship, but Harley looks behind them and sees a tsunami-sized wave of water barrel toward the city. The wave engulfs the city and sinks the entire downtown section of the city in 30 feet of water. The squad with Lantern can make it to the roofs and ready themselves for a fight against Aquaman. Aquaman emerges from the water and causes a water wall to block off an arena for the two of them to fight. Task Force X calls in for Batman. Batman explains they need to fire everything they have at him and that he is sending backup. Any time Aquaman retreats into the water, they need to fish him out to keep him dehydrated for extended periods of time. The squad fights him and fishes for him until he is at half health. Aquaman then reaches the center of the arena, where he begins creating a sonar beacon calling all sea life to him. He sends a shark to leap out of the water and eat one of the members of Task Force X, but just before it can hit, Black Manta, using his jetpack and large helmet, tackles the shark out of the direction of the squad. The boss fight continues with a more powerful Aquaman and army of fish. Black Manta is now assisting by swimming in the water to help target Aquaman and defend against the fish army. Soon enough, Aquaman is fighting both Black Manta and King Shark with Ocean Master's trident. Aquaman is stunned. Batman summons the Batwing to drop the microwave emitter on their location. Harley runs to aim it and activate it. Black Manta and King Shark jump out of the way, and Aquaman is hit with the radiation beam. His skin is burned and shrivels up, and he collapses. The waters recede, and the downtown area of Metropolis is no longer as flooded. The group grabs both Green Lantern and Aquaman, returning them to Task Force 9's hideout. Batman is there to greet them. He implants the brain chip into the two of them and cryogenically freezes them. The Thinker, who was tasked by Batman earlier to break the Justice League computer's encryption, has made some progress. But it seemed like the only way to access more now is to retrieve a portion of a passkey that is in the collective consciousness of each member of the League. The Flash's memory of his passkey was extracted and now Green Lantern and Aquaman's can be as well. Only two more members to go. There is still the Demigod and the Kryptonian out there in the world. If I were to guess, 
That noise we heard earlier was probably Brainiac signaling his main warriors back. They are probably flying here, as we speak. What's the plan now? I've got El Diablo forging a weapon out of an experimental kryptonite Luther was testing for the last few weeks. It's a radioactive crystal that can harm Kryptonian cells. He's going to need a lot of heat if he is going to mold that. So he is at work in the Metropolis steel mill now. For Wonder Woman, finding a vulnerability was a lot harder. She has no known weakness, indomitable grit, and has trained in combat for thousands of years. Although, there is one thing she cannot resist. And what would that be? She cannot back down from a fight. So what? We force her into a fight she cannot stop. Exactly. What happens when she sees us and immediately slices our heads off? She won't have the chance to, at first. Batman walks away from Task Force X to talk to Enchantress, who is in the corner of the room. Batman speaks in an ancient language, and Enchantress responds. They have a small conversation, and they seem to come to an agreement. Enchantress agreed to help me recite a ritualistic spell to open a portal to another dimension. How do you know this is going to work? I don't. It is a very well-educated guess, remember? Besides, I've been there once before. Batman doesn't elaborate any further and walks to a table. He takes some gear and puts it in his utility belt. He tells the squad to go to the west side edge of the skull ship. Batman will meet them there. There seems to be an entrance port they can use to take down the last of the auxiliary shields, but they need to clear the drone farms stationed there first. Task Force X goes and clears out the farms when Wonder Woman flies in. Task Force X hides and takes cover, but Batman emerges from the shadows with Enchantress and calls out for Wonder Woman. Diana, daughter of Zeus and Queen Hippolyta! Wonder Woman immediately charges, but before reaching Batman, a plume of orange smoke engulfs her and she begins coughing. Batman evades and calls for the squad. They rush in behind him and Deathstroke stands side by side with Batman. Batman then recites a spell. Frange inter mundos in trant regnum demones. Just then, reality begins to tear off chunk by chunk, revealing the dimension Batman was referring to earlier. It is the demon world dreamscape from Batman, Arkham City. Batman and Deathstroke walk to confront Wonder Woman. Your illusions do not scare me, Phobos and Deimos. Do the sons of Ares wish to get revenge for their father? And you bring your minions with you. I'll be sure to return both your heads to him when I'm finished. Task Force X and Batman fight with Wonder Woman in the demon world mixed with fear toxin. Batman and Deathstroke are doing the main hand-to-hand -hand damage since they are all magically enchanted by the spell to be strong enough for Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is still fighting at full strength, so Batman hatches a plan to free Enchantress. He goads Wonder Woman to swing her sword, but parries it to have it slice off Enchantress's anti-magic cuff. Enchantress is freed and flies into the sky. Batman yells for her to charge a magic beam. Simultaneously, Batman ups the dosage of the fear toxin on Wonder Woman and becomes Fear Demon Batman. Batman summons a fiery swarm of bats to attack, and Enchantress fires the magical beam at her. She is knocked out, and the demon world starts shifting back to normal. Now, in Metropolis, Batman quickly injects the implant into Wonder Woman while she is still weakened. Enchantress, now free, flies up and away, far past Metropolis and the horizon. The team picks up Wonder Woman, and as they start returning to the cryo facility, a missile is seen in the distance, hurling itself towards Brainiac's skull ship. Waller radios in thanking the squad and Batman for removing the last of the shields and dealing with Wonder Woman. Waller explains how she got back control of the equipment from Batman and ordered the remaining US government to send a nuke to the ship. The squad stands in awe as the countdown to impact is said aloud by Rick Flagg. Just as he says one, the missile seems to stop in mid-air before hitting the ship. Superman returned from across the Earth. He caught the nuclear warhead and flew it a safe distance from the ship. Boomerang sarcastically congratulates Walla for sending the bomb, while Brainiac's strongest lieutenant is still out there to catch it. So, he is still holding it? Good. The nuke explodes at the horizon in the ocean. 
Batman tells the squad to stop standing there to gawk and keep moving. The nuke should disable Superman for a bit, but Batman says not to test that. He has seen Superman get up from a lot more punishment. They still had a job to do and weren't dead yet, so there was still a chance. They return to the cryo facility with Wonder Woman and place her in a cryo chamber. At last, there is Superman, the Man of Steel, the strongest there is. What can we do? I got word from El Diablo. The weapon is almost ready. What is needed now is to stop Superman from instantly annihilating every one of us for a few moments. What can do such a thing? Not a thing. A person. Lois Lane. Superman's love. There are still traces of their former lives in each member of the League. Their minds fight within their hijacked bodies. It won't set him free, but it should leave an opening long enough for us to use the gold kryptonite to dampen his powers and eventually subdue him. Why would this normal woman risk herself in a scenario such as this? She was the one to lead the evacuation effort before most of the heroes were taken over, and she reports daily on Brainiac's movements throughout Metropolis. Track down her signal and bring her to Daily Planet Square. We'll draw him out there. There is no better solution. While you're doing that, I'll deal with Waller. Task Force X goes to find Lois Lane, who is held up in a service tunnel of the subway system. They explain how they need her to break through to Superman. She is doubtful that it would work, but she did see the squad operating in the city. She reported it to any survivors in the area, whenever the squad was fighting Brainiac's forces to move further away to safety. Unintentionally, Task Force X's antics help countless people in hiding make it to safety. If Superman was the last hero standing in their way of directly attacking and stopping Brainiac, she would take that chance. Task Force X escorted Lois to Daily Planet Square. They call Batman, who says he is ready and in position. In the middle of the square, they activate a sonic whistle reminiscent of the sonic batarang, which emits a high-pitch frequency that only Superman can hear. The sky booms with what sounds like rolling thunder as Superman flies to their location. He stops and looks at the squad. <laughs> I have to say, you guys were really a pain in Brainiac's neck for some time now. I'm impressed. You would have made fine contributions to the new world. Too bad, we'll just have to manage without you. Superman lights up his eyes and ready himself to charge, but just then Lois shouts. The Clark that I knew wanted to make a better world, but not like this. Lois? Now, Batman! Batman swoops in with a golden kryptonite spear and stabs Superman in the stomach with it from behind. Lois screams out, not knowing this was part of the plan. Superman looks at the wound, pushes Batman away, and removes the spear. The main fight begins. Superman throws cars and uses freeze breath and lasers. Batman calls in for backup, and the remaining Task Force 9's Black Manta and El Diablo come in to fight. The fight roars on. El Diablo grabs the spear and tries to stab Superman once more from behind. But Superman sensed this and ended up grabbing a hold of El Diablo. Superman lasers him in the heart, but it unintentionally gets El Diablo supercharged. He yells for everyone to run, and he explodes. El Diablo is dead, and the spear in his hands shatters in pieces. Superman is visibly weakened after the whole ordeal and is considerably tired. Quickly, Batman grabs two pieces of the golden kryptonite and palms it in his hands. He then moves to Superman, who is now standing on the ground. He begins to lay a beatdown on Superman, who tries to fight back to no avail. Batman finishes the flurry of blows with a right hook directly to his face, which breaks his hand but knocks out Superman. The group picks up Superman's body and transports him back to the hideout. With a shard of gold kryptonite, the implant is put into Superman's brain and he is placed in the last cryopod. The thinker begins to search Superman's memories to find the last sequence of the passkey, and the computer is unlocked. They read the final messages from the Justice League before they were mind-controlled. Superman was the first to be controlled. Brainiac enticed him with knowledge of his homeworld Krypton and his last living relative, Kara Zor-El. 
Once Superman was assimilated, the rest were easy. The only one that got away was the Flash. He came up with a similar plan to override Brainiac's mind control protocols, starting with Green Lantern. The Thinker pulls up a file last accessed by the Flash. It was a record from the Green Lantern Corps, an antivirus software to isolate and seize control back from Kolu and Nanobots. With the help of Batman, the Thinker uploads the antivirus to all members of the League. Batman turns off the cryo chambers and the entire League begins to wake up, floating in their pods. Their eyes return to normal colour. A sigh of relief is expelled by the whole team. But just then, the roof of the building they were in is ripped off with Brainiac's ship hovering directly above it. The ship begins to suck up everything in the room they were in. The chambers with the League are taken up, the Thinker and Black Manta too. Batman is fast enough to summon the Batwing. He shoots out a net to cover Task Force X, straps it to himself and grapples the Batwing. The squad and Batman make it out of there safely. Batman tells the squad this is their final chance. There is no telling what Brainiac would do now, but they must bring the fight to him before he can either reassimilate the League or worse. The squad had everything they needed to defeat the Justice League once, but now they had to do it again. Batman says to complete any last-minute tasks and meet him at the west side entrance port of the ship. They all make it to the ship and enter it. They fight through hordes of super-powered drones to make it to the main throne room of Brainiac. Batman tells them the plan. You need to throw everything you've got at Brainiac. The more cognitive load is on you, the better. I am going to try to find a back door into his neural mainframe. The squad makes it to the main chamber where Brainiac sits. The thinker's severed head is sitting beside Brainiac's chair. They confront him. Your planet was such a special one, unlike anything I ever encountered. The biodiversity is amazing, leading to all sorts of advancement and sharing of knowledge. Its specimens exhibited the most noble of virtues. But then there's you, pure, unadulterated filth with no hope of rehabilitation. I will not dare allow you to sully my ship with your presence, and I will be sure to eradicate any trace of your existence. I am the hero sent to save this world and this universe, and your heroes will help me do it. The Justice League is seen to be hooked up directly into the ship. They feed Brainiac with their biological energy. The final fight for Earth begins. Brainiac inherited all the powers of the League members. He fights with the skills of Wonder Woman, the strength of Superman, the speed of the Flash, the creativity of Green Lantern, and the army tactics of Aquaman. Brainiac also inherits the weaknesses of the specimens he is feeding off of, and the squad uses that in their favor. Batman calls in from time to time with a status update. I am at Brainiac's central server. There is a cognitive port, no other controls. Once I am in, there is no telling what will await me on the other side. There is no prepping for such an environment. Isn't it just like a computer? That means it should be susceptible to a virus, but a cognitive one. A mental virus? You're Batman. You are prepped for anything, right? There must be something you can do. Do you want to know something funny? There is. Give me some more time, as much time as you can. I am going to make the plunge into his neural net. You hear on the radio Batman scream in pain as he taps into Brainiac's mind. The squad continues to fight Brainiac, but he continues to glitch out. Eventually, the main monitor in his control room displays this. A Joker-themed interface and the Joker's haunting laugh. No. It cannot be. You mustn't. I was only trying to preserve this universe, the knowledge within. There is something worse out there, something newer. Gods beyond our understanding. They will... they will... Ah! 
Brainiac short circuits and has a system-wide meltdown. Brainiac's ship crashes into Metropolis, leaving a large crater in its wake. The squad gets knocked out, but wakes up shortly thereafter. They congratulate themselves and cheer. They radio for Batman, but hear silence. They trek through the destroyed corridors of Brainiac's ship. They free the Justice League members, who are no longer mind-controlled. Task Force X walks around until finding the body. Batman has truly died. There are no signs of life. The League walks to Task Force X, who is standing over the body of Batman. He gave up his life for all of humanity. For the citizens of Gotham. The world. For the Justice League. Even for us. He gave his life even for the worst of us. He died the most honorable death a warrior could ever dream of. A better warrior than me. The Suicide Squad carries Batman's body out of the front port entrance of the ship with the League behind them. They leave Batman's body with the Justice League and Task Force X departs. The Justice League vows to catch them another time, but not this time. Epilogue. The Justice League is holding the official funeral service for Batman. Each member of the League says to the world what Batman meant to them when hearing of his myth. Then the Bat family speaks about the legacy that Bruce left. How even being so stoic and independent, he always loved and counted on his friends. How he would have wanted the heroes of Gotham and the world to be united. In so doing, Tim Drake's Red Robin announces to formation of a new team to aid the Justice League. Now we cut to a montage of setups for subsequent games. The Justice League is having its first meeting back in the Hall of Justice. They turn on the repaired holographic table to find a message left in their cloud server addressed to the team. It is Batman's voice speaking on how he was sorry he never told them the truth about him being alive, but it was for the safety of everyone he loved. He couldn't risk any unnecessary exposure. But that didn't mean the Batman was lost forever. The world and the Justice League still need a Batman. When the message finishes, the door to the Sanctum opens and in enters Dick Grayson's Batman. Next scene, Tim Drake and Oracle are in the Batcave. Oracle has a baby crib right next to her as she works on the Bat computer. Tim asks if she located any metahumans Oracle mentions a person who shapeshifts into different animals last seen in Africa. As they are having this conversation, the Batcave's security system is tripped and out steps a child about 13 years old. Tim Drake asks what is the child's name and he says his name is Damien. And that is the end to my Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League rewrite. Thank you so much for watching the entire thing. I hope you deeply enjoyed it. It took me a lot of hours and a lot of work to get through, but I'm really proud of what uh, I was able to accomplish. And if you really do like it, please like, subscribe, share it with other fans of the Batman Arkham series and even fans of the current Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League game. Uh, but really, from the bottom of my heart, it took a while, but it it's finally here and it's finally worth it. Thank you so much.